That's right, dear listener, two Flash podcasts in one week. Thank you to Brent Friedland for sticking around after yesterday's world uh, analysis. We are now going to discuss the national scene. As many of you know, there are uh, two big races going on this upcoming weekend, one in Uruguay for the World Championship and one in California for the U.S. National Championship, all for venture racing. Um, Brent was kind enough to stick around and to share his thoughts on Bishop and the race and the teams. So another Flash podcast with the Dark Zone. Sit back and relax and enjoy it. Next week, we'll get back to our regularly scheduled programming of regular episodes, no more Flash podcasts, but live it up, folks. This is a great time of the year. Enjoy the adventure racing and enjoy this episode of The Dark Zone. Welcome to The Dark Zone, an adventure racing podcast. This is your host, Brian Gatens. In adventure racing lingo, a dark zone is a time when due to darkness or safety, teams are paused on the course before continuing with the race. During that time, stories are exchanged, friendships are kindled, spirits are restored, and teams have a chance to prepare for the next challenge. We hope that you make good use of this dark zone. We're glad that you're here. Welcome back, dear listener, to the Dark Zone Adventure Racing Podcast. This is your host, Brian Gatens. Um, we are putting our favorite guest analysis, our favorite commenter, Brett Friedland, through his paces, fresh off his world championship <laughs> analysis. We would not let him leave, not let him go to sleep. We've insisted he stays on the pod and he talks about the U.S. ARI National Championships because adventure race fans were drinking from the fire hose this week. I got that for you. This weekend coming up, we have both the world championships and the national championships, either feast or famine. Brent, welcome back to the podcast. You are our favorite commentator, our favorite announcer. We're going to send you a sticker because you're so good at what you do. Tell us about nationals. What's your analysis? What are you thinking? Go for it. Well, first of all, Brian, thanks for having me back on 15 minutes after I was just on. And uh, dear listeners, know that I don't actually think I'm anybody's favorite uh, analysis analyzer. That's not at all right. An, uh, analyst. There we go. It's late at night. Uh, I just happened to be awake at 1030. So um, thanks, Brian, for having me. Um, yeah. So my my initial thoughts are I'm really bummed not to be at nationals. This is, um, you know, in some ways, it's, it's the first time I haven't been able to go to nationals in my racing career. The only other two times I, I did not attend a nationals um, was the year it got canceled because of COVID. And then uh, another year when my, my mother happened to pass away uh, in the couple of weeks leading up to it. Um, but otherwise, I've been racing nationals since 2007. And I was super pumped to finally go out to the West Coast for my first nationals. I started racing in 2007 in Missouri and missed the first couple that were actually on the West Coast before Troy Farrar uh, decided to stop going out West. So I think the racers are in for an amazing course. Um, it looks like it's going to be a, a challenging course. Um, I will, I guess, say that I am privy to a little bit of um insight into the course. Um, you know, I've had a look at the maps, uh, for anyone listening, I absolutely promise I'm not sharing that with any, anybody, um, you know, but, uh, it will obviously have a very different flavor being out in the Sierras. So big mountains, probably some technical terrain. And I I really expect those things to play a role in how this thing shakes out. One of our most recent, more popular podcasts is Yishai Horowitz, the, uh, the the race director for Nationals, um, which is really, really getting a lot of listeners in here. Um, clearly, folks who are interested in the race are listening to it. He talked a lot about that. He talked a lot about the uh, the mountain biking, the fact that it's going to be technical. Uh, he or he talked about wider tires, um, not a ton of water on the course, a lot of elevation on the course. So he really set the scene up um, for our uh, Western Nationals to be a really challenging race for the teams that can make their way out there. Um, we're, we're also very pleased to note that, you know, Yishai on, on his episode talked about concerns about fire danger. It appears that that is not an issue for an issue for Bishop, California, um, that the race will continue in the original location. Um, kudos to USARA and to Yishai for having Catalina Island as a backup race course. He did not have to use. It's hard to plan one race. Imagine planning two. So it's great to see nationals going on. Um, gonna be tough for the teams that come from the lowlands getting out there to nationals um altitude as we all know is a great leveler for a lot of people so teams that traditionally do very well um may struggle out there with that plus the heat plus the terrain um not going to be an easy race for anybody 
when you look at the team list, Brent, and you sort of get a, a sense of who's going out there, what are your thoughts? Who do you see as being your, your early favorites? Yeah, so I kind of identified, I think, four or five teams that I think all strike me as teams that have a, the potential of ending up on the top of this thing. Um, you know, and as I said in your, uh, in, in the world analysis that we did with Craig Cook earlier this evening, I always like to preface these kinds of analyses by, um, by noting that there's usually some local team that I'm not aware of. Right. Um, I definitely have a, a deeper knowledge of these teams than I do, you know, the 74 world's teams competing in, in Paraguay next week. But, um, yeah, so there's probably someone that I'm not going to mention who deserves to be mentioned, especially from the local racing. Um, but with that said, um, you know, I think that probably most people are starting by looking at Toyota Tundra, the defending champions, and they should for a good reason. Um, you know, all three of those uh, athletes are tremendous racers. All three have won uh, multiple national championships. Um, they probably have the best one two punch in the race when it comes to navigation. And they have Mary Chandler, who, you know, I would uh, p- personally argue is the single best active racer in adventure racing in the United States and one of the best racers in the world. Um, you know, so it's hard to bet against them. However, um, I think they're in for perhaps a tougher, um, you know, maybe some tougher competition than they saw in Wisconsin. And they saw tough competition in Wisconsin. They really did, uh, quest pushed them all the way to the end. But, um, you know, the little sense that I've gotten, um, you know, and this is mostly from like, just kind of, you know, taking a peek at, uh, some past races from each I've not actually seen the maps checkpoint by checkpoint, but, um, I'm not sure that you're going to get the same really technical navigation that they had in Wisconsin, which, uh, Justin and Brian really thrive on. And I, I think that will potentially open things up a little bit more, um, and, and neutralize their strength. I also think like, we're talking like 11 to 12,000 feet of vert right? Like they're going to hit a high point, I think over 11,000 feet, maybe twice. I don't know how Justin and Brian will hold up in that kind of elevation. Right. Um, and most teams have that kind of question mark, right? There's very few teams here where I think all three racers are coming from elevation. So I think that that's certainly an issue for everybody, but I think all of that might neutralize that a little bit. So I'm also looking, um, at bones, Right. You know, Bones is one of the most experienced uh, teams in North America and the world. Uh, They also it's a it's a bit of a funny Bones lineup. You've got Roy Malone, who's been the heart of Bones forever. Uh, but he's racing with Marco from Vita Raid, um, which is, a, uh, you know, I, we don't tend to see, you know, uh, people from those elite teams racing at worlds too often, um, outside of maybe Mary Chandler. Um, so seeing Marco on that team is interesting. Uh, and I think Stephanie Bishop, is that right, Brian? Do you, I think that's correct. I think that's right. Is, is racing with them. And she's an incredibly strong OCR racer not nearly as much adventure racing experience. And I think she's from New York. So you've got the vert questions there as well. And I'm not sure who's navigating, but I I think that um, the course is in in Roy Malone's backyard. So I'm not sure he needs a map to to do the race. Um, So you got to think about bones. Um, You know, Bend has a a team going with, I think, Jason Magnus and uh, Max King. You know, Max is a tremendous runner. Um, They uh, unfortunately lost their third teammate relatively recently um, and so had to scramble this week, I think, to find somebody. And uh, they've got a wonderful team teammate joining them, Amanda Boley. Um, We uh, got to see her up close and personal at Endless Mountains this year. But, uh, I, you know, I, I don't know if Amanda has the experience racing on a top team to, you know, necessarily be able to hang at that level. She might, I just really don't know, uh, right. what her ability levels are at that level in this kind of race. Um, I also, I'm kind of saving, uh, my, my pick for last, Um, I think my dark horse is uh, actually a team that probably most people don't know much about. Uh, But Brian, you and I know a lot about them. And those are our friends from up north. um, And that would be Team Vert. Um, They are new to the AR scene. 
uh, and they are incredibly strong and fast athletes. I, I really feel strongly that within the next few years, we're going to see Team Vert mixing it up for a podium spot at nationals uh, and potentially, you know, position themselves to have a chance to win the race if they want to pursue adventure racing. They're new to the sport. They're figuring it out very quickly. They have all the physical talents you need to succeed at a very high level. Um, and and they're, uh, you know, figuring out navigation as well um, and navigating quite well. Um, my question about them is just, do they have the technical experience that it sounds like this course is going to require? And I'm not sure if they do so, but I'm watching them as, as I think my dark horse. And I think that then leaves me, I'm just skimming through the list one more time. Um, I think that leaves me with the team that I am tentatively picking to win it. Uh, and that is Teton Adventure Racers. Um, and, uh, you know, Abby and Jason have both won national championships before back with tech new. Um, I don't know their third team, uh, uh, teammate as well, but he's, I see he's from steamboat Colorado. So I suspect that from a, an elevation standpoint, that team is, is, is well suited for this race. And, um, even though they may not be as well known, like all, you know, Jason and Abby have raced big races, they've raced world championships. Um, they're the real deal and they can win this race. So I think those are the four or five teams I'm watching at the top. So I think you make a valid point that this is going to be last year's world championships up in, in the Midwest, up in uh, Wisconsin was, was driven by navigation really kind of drove that race. You know, um, the folks who want to go back and listen to some of the archives, we interviewed um, Mary Chandler and, and her team following that race. And they talked a lot about how the contours really worked in their, in their, in their favor and their navigation came across. If I hear you correctly. Um, and once again, I've not really seen the maps for the race. I have a general sense of the course, but I, it would be wrong for me to say I've seen the maps. Um, the, the, the terrain, the elevation, the heat, really, it feels as if it's going to uh, teams that are, are, are physically sound, that could work with the elevation. It sounds like if it feels like they may have a bit of an advantage on this course, it feels like it might be a bit of a drag race that it's, it's not a super technical navigation course going into it. So therefore the more fit teams are going to do better. And so you're leaning heavily upon like teams that live at elevation, train at elevation and teams that really come from the West. It sounds like that's where you're kind of putting your, your chip, so to speak. I think I am. And, you know, I want to be clear, like, again, I, I've not actually seen a map with checkpoints on it. Um, so I, I really don't know for sure what the nav is going to look like in this race. Um, I just don't think it's going to play to the strengths that the technical orienteering at Stubber Mule did, right? You know, Paula in Wisconsin, um, you know, has a reputation for that kind of navigation. We all knew that going in. Um, I, I expect this race to feel different just based off, you know, what I've heard about Eshai's races. Um, and I haven't competed them in, you know, myself, um, you know, so I think it's going to be, um, a great event. And I think, like you said, I think it's gonna, it, it may be more about speed and power and elevation and, and such, but, you know, I was just going to bring up the weather. Have you happened to take a look at the weather? I haven't looked too closely at it. I know that it's been rather warm out West, but I know that some rain had been coming in this week. So taking a look at, uh, at Bishop here, um, where the kind of home base, I guess, is. Um, Friday, I, we've got 85 degrees. Right, with a low of 46. And, they have a 40 degree. Yeah. In the 40s. And, you know, if they're up in the mountains, it's probably going to be an even wider swing than that. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think whether, you know, their temperatures are going to play a role too, right? You know, I think you're up at elevation, 85 degrees out in the sun all day. Um, I think that's going to play, you know, a factor that we obviously can't, we can't predict. Yeah, it's going to be dry for them. We see that here, uh, high of 85, low of 49. To your point, being up in the mountains, knocking another 5, 10 degrees off of that, they could be touching the high 30s. Um, yeah. So I definitely, I would be packing the puffy if I was if I was doing this race, I'd be prepared for that. Um, yeah. But no rain coming in, so at least they won't have to worry about the kind of sticky mud that they would see if they if they got rained on. I'm sure California would love some rain right now that is not seeing it for this weekend. Um, yeah. So you've yeah, taken so off yeah, a lot I mean, of the boxes. I 
What's that? You've ticked off a lot of the boxes, right? You've talked about the elevation, the relative strength of the teams, the type of course that we think it's going to be. You know, once again, we are we are uh, we are analyzing the best type of analysis when you don't actually know what you're talking about, right? We don't know where we are yet in terms of the course, but your all signs point to a, a race that will benefit the faster teams that could move well over technical terrain. Yeah, I, I think so. You know, I, I think that the technical elevation and, you know, I, I just have to wonder, you know, if local knowledge comes into play as well, um, you know, is, is that an advantage for a couple of the teams out there? You know, I know, um, I think it's tower racing. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I've got a, a list of kind of the, the the chase teams, the dark horses that could mix it up in that in that podium run. And uh, tower racing is up high for me. Um as maybe the like dark horse local team. And I, I don't have the data in front of me, but if I remember correctly, I think two of them live basically on the course, you know, like up in that general area around Bishop, um, you know, so like, I'm guessing that they have quite a bit of knowledge. I think Roy Malone knows a lot about the area, um, you know, cause he lives out there as well. So I think that's going to be a huge factor. I think also too, is we, we can't count out, you know, when we talk about teams that will be, have experience coming to the table, we have a strong machine coming out there, right? So you, you have Cliff, Kate, and Glenn Lewis, you know, strong team coming out of uh, coming out of Maine. They had a really good performance in um, Itera in Scotland. I know that, that Cliff was on that team there, um, and Glenn and Kate are strong in their in their own right too. So you're right, there's, there's a, aside from the five, six teams that you checked off going into that on um, paper, there may be a dark horse team that we don't necessarily know a whole lot about that comes across as well as some teams that might be peaking at the proper time. Um, a lot of folks have circled this on their calendar as being the most important race of their year. Um, and because we've known so long about the general location, known so long about the race itself, teams are really coming into a prepared to race. Naira is sending a team out. Um, Chris Rice is, is captaining that team. Other two teammates are still someone I know they've been determined already but they're going to be out there um, competing Um, a lot of uh, strength there with that. And so you're right. You never quite know who's going to show up and someone else could sneak in and they could really put a performance out there. That's rather strong. Um, But I, to your point, I can't walk away from the idea that the, the terrain is going to be really hard for anybody coming from back East. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I think so. And I mean, I think you kind of skim through the other teams and a couple other teams that stand out, you know, again, I think kind of um, highlighting the importance of potential local knowledge. I'm actually really interested to see Team Psyched race. Yep. yep. Um, you know, they, uh, you know, for people that don't know Team Psyched, uh, they are a family, right? Mm-hmm. A family team. And uh, the kids are getting older and I think more you know, capable of racing at a higher level, um, kind of the same progression or a similar progression to what we saw with Hunter Leininger over the years. Um, except it, the whole, the whole team is that right. You know, it's, it's usually the, their father, Shane, and a couple of the kids racing. Um, and I don't remember what event it was recently, but they recently, um, competed in an event and I think we're on the podium, um, for it out West. So, you know, and, and I think they, I think they live somewhere where there's elevation. So they could be a team to, to kind of watch for the, maybe that five through 10 spot. Um, and uh, orienteering Utah, right. Uh, you know, those guys also have quite a bit of experience uh, in terms of Western racing. Um, you know, so I think those are two of the other teams that I'm watching closely uh, in terms of the, the premier mixed division teams. But again, like, you know, you skim through this list, team Kodiak, big bear. I don't, I don't know that team at all. Um, the other one that kind of jumps out just in terms of their name is big bear adventure racing. And, um, you know, I think there's a Tahoe adventure racers, you know, I kind of assume that all these people have some experience with Ishai's events out West. And if they've got elevation and mountain legs, like they, they could, they could be quite good. The, um, come back to team psych dad's racing with a 16 year old and a 15 year old. Right. Yeah. And remember being 16 and 15, you could run for days. Right. And if you're working and plus you want to beat your sibling, right. Never admit anything to them. So they'll have a, a strong performance out there. Um, and so, and you're right. As, as we scan through this list, we're seeing a, a, a nice chase group will be, will be coming across the line as we go across here. Um, you know, you have, you have Ibex, like I said, and loving it is out there. We mentioned team psyched. Um, we're looking at, uh, Burf Barf, who doesn't love Burf Barf, right? They've yeah. they've clearly jumped onto the adventure racing scene. 
Um, I know that they've they've forsaken other races they've done every year, like the Barkley Fall Classic to come out there and race. And so credit to, to, to Ann and her crew for getting out there and really diving into this. Lauren is very, very strong. Um, I think that they could definitely uh, surprise a lot of people out there on the course. And so there's, to their credit, they've really assembled a strong group of racers. Uh, Team Onyx Tiki is heading out there um, with, with Neela Wader, who is a, an, early, um, an early member of the of the dark zone, uh, interviews, uh, we all came on super early and he was one of our early additions and did a great job with it. So there's definitely, um, a lot of strong people are heading out there to California to really dive into the nationals that are being hosted out there, uh, for the first time in a long time and credit to, to Garrison, USARA, the executive director and Yishai Horowitz from out there adventures for putting together a race, um, in pretty challenging conditions. Yeah. You know, we have also, we can't forget Orienteer in Utah. We don't quit. And of course, you've been very, very gracious. Rootstock Racing is sending a team out. Um, yeah. And Rootstock is sending, this is the first time um, that they're sending as an all-female Rootstock team. It's, uh, it's, it's Abby Perkis, um, Nikki Driscoll as the navigator, and Karen Delaney as the team stoker. So they'll be out there racing uh, on behalf of Rootstock. Um, so I know that we're very excited to see who, who does well out there. Um, a lot of strong teams, a lot of teams that will be in the chase pack. Um, and there are some teams out there um, who are just going to go out there and have a hell of a time and see what they could do out there in a challenging course. Yeah. I do know that um, uh, the media team at USARA has put together a pretty expansive program for everybody coming up. They could check out uh, the USARA website. I know there's going to be some live tracking obviously will exist. Uh, some commentary during the race, as well as some um, online media and live broadcasts from out on the race course. Um, and so yeah. it looks like Nationals is going to shape up to be a great event. Um, we don't know who's going to be on the podium, but there's a lot of good teams out there that are looking to get up there and we'll see how they do. Yeah, no, I, I think it's going to be really exciting to watch. And, um, you know, for folks that haven't raced uh, nationals or, you know, perhaps people that haven't necessarily gone to nationals with the hope of either racing for the podium or even, you know, trying to secure a top five or top 10 spot, um, you know, this race is a little different than other races. And uh, it is fast and fast furious from the beginning. And, um, I have a feeling that that is not going to work as well for at least a few of the competitive teams as it normally does because of the, those conditions, especially that elevation. So I think it's going to be an interesting race to watch for those first six to 10 hours. Um, I have a feeling there might be a couple surprises early where we might see a couple of those, you know, top, uh, top, contending teams or some of the chase back teams that we think could be in the mix, um, end up really falling back, um, and maybe taking themselves out of being able to really, um, achieve some of those goals that they might have for themselves. If they're not careful about how they manage that, that, that early part of the race. I think it's also worth pointing out for the folks who are sitting at home, who are wondering about the structure for nationals this year, uh, US area was wise in setting it up. When they opened up registration, teams that had performed well the year before had priority uh, registration going over time. And until the race were to sell out, they've slowly opened up to a wider and wider field. Um, so what's great about this race is that uh, anybody who could assemble a team and get out to California gets to race in national championships. And in my conversation with Garrison on an earlier uh, edition of the Dark Zone, it opens up the idea that a team that people really don't know about could train in private, could get ready, could get, you know, they could, they could get prepped for this race and they could surprise people when they get out there. Um, you know, we know what we know, but we don't know what we don't know. And so good luck to those teams that may be overperforming out there who we look up and you could have a team close to the front who really will surprise all of us. And to your point earlier, Brent, there are teams that are on this list that we don't know a whole lot about. Um, and they have a chance to sort of show themselves to us when we go out there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's vert for me, but there might be another vert on this list that would, that we don't know about. Yeah, exactly. So today we're, this is being recorded on the 12th of September. It's going to get dropped. Probably you'll be getting this world on Tuesday or Wednesday. The race starts this Friday um, and it runs from to 30 hours. It's a 30 hour race. So, Tune in this Friday, uh, going into Friday into Saturday. Um, we'll have a whole U.S. area. We'll have a whole uh, wide array of offerings. Everybody out there, to learn more about it. Uh, Brent, you've been gracious with your time today for two podcasts. I appreciate you doing the Flash Podcast here. 
any final thoughts before we uh, we say goodnight to our listeners and we head off to our respective lives? I I honestly don't. I would just wish everybody, um, you know, a good luck for this weekend, yeah, regardless of which race you're doing, but uh, especially those competing at nationals. Uh, I hope it's a wonderful event. I hope it goes off without a hitch. Uh, I'm excited to follow. And, um, you know, I, I think that uh, it's a hard race to predict, which always makes it fun. So I'm looking forward to following along. And like I said, we'll have a lot of analysis going on, probably do a, a post-race, maybe a mid-race with some teams that we could drag to in a TA who may not be running through the TA and at least some post-race analysis. Once again, thanks to USARA for putting on the national championships out West. It's been a strong endeavor and we look forward to the success of all the teams. Thanks again, Brent. Cool. Thank you, Brian.